Hello and welcome to this podcast on William Blake and the body. This is a guest episode for the podcast series Visionary, How William Blake Changed the World. We're recording this episode from the Centre for 18th Century Studies at the University of York. And by we, I mean myself, Hannah McAuliffe, and I'm joined by Professor John Mee and Dr. Sharon Cho. Hello to you both. Hello. <laughs> so John really needs no introduction, but nonetheless, he is Professor of 18th Century Studies here at the University of York. And he is, of course, a longtime Blakeian. Sharon is an early career researcher who recently finished her PhD at York on Blake disability and Old Norse reception in 18th century poetry. Her research generally revolves around the language and representation of disability in the 18th century, the myth of nationhood and Old Norse reception in 18th century British literature. And as I said, I'm Hannah McAuliffe and I'm a current PhD student here at York working on Blake and Systems. My doctoral research is generously funded by the AHRC and I also have them to thank for facilitating this podcast today. So we're going to be talking broadly about the body in Blake's work, uh, his visual and poetic depictions of human and non-human bodies, and how he uses the body as a metaphor in his own work and for his own work. So we'll stick to a generally chronological approach, uh, beginning with Blake's earlier depictions of human form. Uh, and they really did begin relatively early in his life, uh, since Blake never attended a conventional school and was instead educated at Henry Parr's drawing school and then at the Royal Academy, and he also undertook an apprenticeship in engraving, uh, which is actually a rather bodily kind of labour, as we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, but life drawing and an understanding of the human anatomy were key components of Blake's education throughout his youth, and many of his earliest available works consist of depictions of the human form. So I'd like to pause here for a moment and allow us to kind of respond to some of Blake's earlier work. Oh, and I should note that I'm drawing a distinction here around 1795 when I refer to Blake's early versus late work, um, as 1795 is kind of natural marker between two periods of composition of Blake's illuminated prophetic books, um, from which he kind of took a hiatus between 1795 and 1804, though he was printing older books during that time. Uh, so yes, let's look at some early depictions of the body. So for listeners, we have got in front of us Blake's earliest extant engraving, which is titled Joseph of Arimathea on the Rocks of Albion. Uh, we've also got the famous frontispiece to Europe, also known as the Ancient of Days, and the almost as famous painting Glad Day or Albion Rose. Um, and if you are listening to this on YouTube, we'll, uh, we'll include visuals on there. Um, so John and Sharon, what can we say stands out about the human form in Blake's early work and how can we characterise Blake's early depictions of the body? Okay, so I, I, I'm going to speak first because Sharon has basically pushed me <laughs> yeah. to the swimming pool and you know, I increasingly say I, I, I've worked on Blake for a long time but I, I currently live my Blake life through my graduate students. So that's my own thing. But one thing I would say is that um, What's striking is not that you know he draws a human form, but how much emphasis their own muscularity. He doesn't try and get away from that. Yeah, you, know, you could say that derived from what was being taught in Basil's school, and it's a what we might call a Michelangelesque mm -hmm. taste in Blake. But we might also say, well, why is he so drawn to that? Why is that his taste? I don't think it's entirely just formed by context. Mm -hmm. I think it was Marilyn Butler who who first mentioned to me that for all the and when she said this to me this sort of neoplatonic approach to Blake, the thing in Blake, Blake is mainly about spirituality mm -hmm. the great physicality of his drawing the way the drawings seem to draw attention and the engravings to physicality mm -hmm. and then and that the the makeup and dismemberment of the human body the fact that it's it is something that's made up of cells fibers and other things mm -hmm. is absolutely at the front and center and it's only you know, when you see the books with the visual element, that really strikes you and strikes you first of all. And perhaps it's it's very hard not to be struck by the physicality of Blake in the uh, in the illuminated books. Um, if you're just reading the text, you may not see it. And certainly, these early drawings immediately, I think, make that yeah. front and central. Yeah, um, definitely. And obviously, and this is me passing up on the <laughs> show. I mean, the Joseph of Arimathea is very much. The relationship between his interest in the body and his interest in 
northern antiquities is is yeah. something that strikes you about that picture yeah and i mean i think you're absolutely right about kind of the muscularity of it and i think i think it was in my thesis i was like talking about they're, they're very like blakian like recognizable like you don't you might not really know them but you might see a picture and be like oh yeah it's the very like a courgette statue almost like you can kind of see that royal academy influence mm. but he just has this kind of unique spin to it and with like the joseph arimathea um i mean the posture is still it's so broad and mm. yet it's closed in at mm. the same time so it mm. has this interesting idea of openness but also closed offness mm -hmm. and i think that plays into the poetry as well like in the later stuff yeah, um, what do you mean by openness? So <laughs> I'm going to graduate supervision <laughs> mode, but no, gen generally, because I can say something about openness. It's interesting. I mean, I, th I, I think it's just like the posture of it. So he's right. still very broad. He right. takes up a lot of the frame. Imposing. Yeah. Right. And so, and it's actually a very strong posture, like with mm. one foot forward yeah. and very muscular right. legs. I mean, mm. look at the calf muscle there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and but his arms are kind of like. Yeah, yeah. He's holding himself. Right, right. Um, so you get the sense of you are kind of being invited in to engage mm -hmm. with the body because he's just taking up so much and you can barely see the landscape behind mm -hmm. and around. And yet you can't see every single aspect mm -hmm. of him. Whereas, you know, um the front piece at Albion, right? Like Albion Rose. Yeah, yeah, there's there's more it's very open, outstretched arms, mm -hmm. outstretched legs, like um, and you're engaging with it in a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, so. I mean, the other thing that strikes me, and again, this is just giving you an easy pass in a way, but they, they're both inviting, you know, jo Joseph Arimathea is a, you know, is, appears in narratives of the foundation of Englishness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Glad Day seems to be, is often read as some sort of national mm -hmm. figure. Mm -hmm. So that idea of this, this is a, a body politic. Yeah. Uh, standing for the nation in some way it'd be interesting to hear you say something about that yeah i mean i like hardly looked at the really like yeah early, early stuff. stuff super early um i work on like something mm -hmm. yeah. but um yeah i think it's interesting to think about in terms of body politic because it's like what do you want the nation to be like how do you want it to be represented yeah. like are you wanting to kind of welcome people to kind of view you as something that's glorious and mm -hmm. you know majestic or are you wanting people to like question it so right. it's kind of also i think the impact the approach the perspective and the questions you are wanting to yeah ask i definitely want to yeah. return to those challenges a little bit later so i liked what you're saying about the way that it's open and closed like the self-protective gesture mm -hmm. with the arms closed yeah just remember and like he's looking down mm -hmm. i'm not particularly sure what he's looking at but he's like looking down as well there's a little bit of a disconnect yeah there's there. not got the same sort of confidence i suppose as, as mm. the figure in albion rose it's quite sentimentalized though it's not mm. stern is it no no the eyes are quite soft yeah, in yeah. A way. this soft. is interesting yeah uh, but yeah the i mean it's interesting in terms of your the body politic thing about i mean perhaps it's a seems like a a naff gesture to the present day, present day politics but there's some inclusiveness about the open yeah. arms i mean it's it may be standing for but it may also be inviting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. others in which i'm mm -hmm. sure we'll come back to this but that yeah. idea of the body is never complete yeah like, mm -hmm. so it may be muscular presence but it's open mm -hmm. to yeah. adaptation and and when it comes to body politic i mean it's also thinking about the cultural influences because you mentioned the old north kind of yeah. northern influence and i mean there was the way blake uses that is interesting it shifts and changes mm -hmm. and but like in general there is the idea of like the gothic tribes liberty gothic commonwealth and looking at the joseph of arimathea print, like you're kind of wondering can you see that here yeah. and if not why not yeah, like, yeah it does invite those kind of questions because it does have that strength mm -hmm. i think i mean you can i think you can agree that he looks quite strong yeah definitely yes. and it's sort we of powerful figure. we can agree that's yeah. something. <laughs> We can. I was thinking that's where I was looking at it earlier. The strong, like especially the thigh muscles are so yeah. thick on Joseph Ar of Arimathea, as well as Ancient of Days. Like he's yeah. got this kind of equally yeah. thick thigh muscle as well, and mm -hmm. the very like imposing, powerful, impressive yeah. figures, yeah. Um, which stands out to me about the early works. And there's no kind of like discernible flaws to the the bodies depicted in the early works mm -hmm. compared to the late ones, as we'll 
kind of move on to they become much less normative i think mm -hmm. yeah although yeah it's interesting i mean maybe they're just the, the fact that the second one is colored because um and it's related to close and open i suppose because the once you can see muscles then you can see veins you might get a sense of it as a system it you know it's not a closed body that's the end of it it's got things flowing mm -hmm. through it that probably is more the case here on the ancient of days yeah yeah and in the ancient of days actually because the the reds they do suggest the flow of blood and these mm -hmm. muscles look like they've got blood vessels yeah. that make such a perhaps that's i don't know it, it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to to open that question up to YouTube for viewers, what they think yeah, about the first one. Yeah, leave a yeah, comment. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. So I'd like to move on now to another of Blake's early works of the 1790s, and that's the Book of Urizen. So the picture of the body in Urizen is really quite different, mm. isn't it? So far, um, that's <laughs> these are the only two plates I've got actually. Mm. Um, and of course, not just in the visual depictions, but in the poetry. Mm. Um, it's it seems like a real turning point in terms of Blake's conception of the body here. I know that you wrote quite a lot on yours in. Yes. Right. <laughs> 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 so then it back to you. Um, she wrote more than actually left in the theme. <laughs> <laughs> so we get in yours in this kind of conception in the visual. Let's begin with the visual depictions before mm -hmm. we move on to the poetry. These kind of restricted, uh, hunched over, contorted mm -hmm. bodies. And I don't know what changed for Blake between these earlier depictions that we've just mentioned and then when he gets to Eurozone, it's just so different. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any way to reconcile that. Well, uh, let, let's put the, the NAF historical reading out there, which is not necessarily only a political reading, I guess it's biographical as well, which I, I don't think it works, but we may as well say that, you know, arguably, there's a loss of revolutionary confidence or of optimism or something. Mm -hmm. So that what's yeah. seen as endlessly reconfigurable and openness is now closed mm -hmm. down. Yeah. Um, I guess there's also been another reading that, you know, is the vegetative body trope, which starts to come more and that the body is itself death mm -hmm. somehow, which I, I don't think any of us buy into. Uh -huh. no. um, and, but, you know, obviously there, the, the body is a closed system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and is a skeleton, and there, and in the, the one where you actually see the the fleshly body, in a way, it's blinded, it's it's constrained. Uh, I guess that the fact that this body's chained leaves over the possibility that if the chains went, it could mm -hmm. be the the glad day. And there's always that sense of that is the vegetative body of simply a state from which things can be liberated. Mm -hmm. There's always that seems to be a version of the, re the redeemable body, mm -hmm. or is this what the body is? I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think it opens the question of: Is there always a possibility for it to change, or is this what it is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there is like no answer <laughs> to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's no clear answer. That's kind of what scholars are constantly thinking about: yeah. like, can it change? And if it can, what can it change mm -hmm. into? Yeah. Um, and we kind of see it here for, yeah. In, mm -hmm multiple different ways yeah so within the poetry of yours and blake does create a sort of creation narrative within that as he describes the creation of of the body and goes through these uh, seven ages of dismal woe as as a parody of the seven days of creation um i was just wondering sharon if there's any kind of old norse inflection that you can bring to that yes. i should say before you say go on. Uh, Jan used to ban the word parody, yeah, talking about that aspect of the parody. She got very yeah. angry yeah. about that it was a parody. So. Well, I think it's just because it's there's just so many different ways of imagining that. And I think creation, like there is that aspect of creation, but there's also the aspect of destruction mm -hmm. linked into it. And I think when you think about those seven ages that mm -hmm. happen and each age is dictated by the body, is is it actually being created or is it actually being broken down? Mm -hmm. And again, you get that question of yeah. what's actually happening. Is it another potential for it to be reformed mm -hmm. or is it the potential to break it down and maybe reform it into a, a different alternate mm -hmm. model? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, in terms of like the Norse influences, I guess, like there is through the idea of creation, um, the myth of Ymir, um, where in the Old Norse creation myth, the world is created 
from the body of this evil mm-hmm. giant and it's like pulled apart and there's like the rivers of blood mm-hmm. and Odin and all of his brothers and they, they kind of all come together and take all the different elements and make the clouds, the sea and mm-hmm. the earth. And you can kind of see that visceral imagery. You can kind of hear it in the language. If you know the Norse myth, then, you know, you can go read it. You can kind of almost map it out. It's very, very interesting how he seems to, like, it's part of the way he borrows from different cultures. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there is a very strong connection there with the Norse myth, because it is all starting from Mm -hmm. the body. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So the creation of the body in Eurozone is really quite traumatic. I think is is that the same in the old Norse myth? Is there that kind of trauma about it as well? I mean, there's less trauma in that, I guess, because it was oral poetry before it was written down. So you don't really mm-hmm. get the same kind of the intonation. You yeah. don't really get a sense of that. But it is seen as there was this evil giant. Mm-hmm. He was formed between like the different realms, um, mm-hmm. Norse realms, and he was killed and used as <laughs> like the material landscape um, and you can kind of see that with yeah. heroes and he becomes this material landscape yeah. as well um which is a really interesting version of creation mm-hmm. you don't really get that with the christian sense mm-hmm. right it's seven days of creation everything was kind of made um but i i can't remember who it was but there is like a reading that that whole element when yours and body is broken down into the landscape mm-hmm. it's maybe a metaphor for like pregnancy which is also another interesting way of thinking mm-hmm. about it. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you buy mm. into that kind of reading. Um, Sounds like Tristan Connolly. I think it's Tristan Connolly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was Tristan Connolly. I mean, the interesting thing is that the body, he, when he breaks away from the Eternals, he mm-hmm. makes the body then. And there's a question about the Eternals, which are always plural, are they embodied? We do see beings, don't we? The, um, 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 and there's a lot of body making as well as those. And at one point it seems that he wants to stabilize his sense of self by having a body, but it turns out mm-hmm. that's a delusion. That, yeah. And it seems to be a delusion again and again. That you know, wh- Whether you read it as a kind of materialist delusion that we are this thing, or whether the point is that he has a, a kind of idea of the body is, re- you know, it, it may still be in some senses, mm-hmm. Mater- perhaps materialist is not the right word, but a physical sense of that you're the identity can be tied to physical forms, but those physical forms aren't fixed and there's no identity because there's so much body making and yeah. as you said, body disassembling in yeah. that book is uh, um, maybe like thinking about the idea that the body is again, it's a structure and yeah. it's a type of organization yeah. again, yeah. and it's another way of categorizing yeah. something. Yeah, you could always call it a system. Yeah, you could. <laughs> and what I mean, what about the bodies? Is just, I, just, I, I should say to the listener, mm-hmm. I've, so I've asked Sharon, which <laughs> Hannah's is very interested in systems. Yeah. So, what is at stake in thinking the body as a system in, in these examples? Um, well, I think the body is, so as a metaphor, is very flexible to use in reference to any kind of system, sort of a bounded system, which can also have a diverse internal makeup, like within the body. The body is sort of matter system, then within that you've got the minor systems, digestive, respiratory, cardiovascular, yeah. etc. So I think Blake can kind of play on that to encourage us to to break down the body into these minor parts which can can be extracted or mm-hmm. put back together and reassembled. Uh, disassembled in similar way to his prophetic books as well like Sharon was saying the body is a structure Mm -hmm. as is the book and I think this is something that you know I'm kind of chewing over at the moment those similarities between bodies as systems and structures and books as systems and and structures Mm -hmm. and the fact the cliche about systems uh, which I think you've thought about a bit Mm -hmm. is you know I must create the system of being slave by another man but what about thinking about that in relation to that the narrative of the body being made, you know, because mm-hmm. as in the book he reasoned, that there is yeah. a chained body system yeah. and loss is trying to control mm-hmm. for the good of eternity, it seems, mm-hmm. you reason by chaining him. But what he does is create a body that turns mm-hmm. out to be a frightening reflection of his own body. Mm-hmm. Although I can't remember, is that that line is only used in a later prophetic book, isn't it? He saw what he became, what he beheld. I think the line only comes later, but the idea, the, the idea occurs yeah. within Eurism because loss chains Eurism then ends up chained himself. Yeah. So there is that kind of 
self-replicating system in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we've kind of arrived at this central paradox yeah. within Blake's work. And you, you've both mentioned Tristan Connolly. Um, and she refers to the way that Blake at once reviles and glorifies the human body. Um, so we've got this kind of contradiction with the way that the body is represented in Eurozone as this sort of abject, wretched, uh, restrictive, um, non-inflexible, sort of, you know, crawling, wretched thing, um, as as appeared as uh, contrasted against Blake's idea of the human form divine, mm. um, which appears in songs, um, particularly divine image, where it mentions the human form divine and almost almost love the human form and so on. And uh, the marriage of heaven and hell, where Blake writes that all deities reside in the human breast. So, I just this, I mean, this is a very difficult question. Is there any way to kind of reconcile those two? You know, the human form divine and the sort of restrictive vegetable body. Well, um, I, I'd be. I mean, it'd be interested if Tristan was here whether she think this was a reasonable gloss on what she said because you could say, yeah, reverence revives and glorifies the human body, but you could say. He reviles and glorifies two different ideas of the human body, whether that's about perceptions of the way the body is perceived, yeah. which will maps onto questions about the politics of body mm -hmm. politics as well. I think is an interesting one. You know, so I I don't think um, I stand to be corrected, but there are many. You know, there are a lot, there's lots of writing, especially in the Christian tradition. Um, Edit that. <laughs> That's just a joke for the rest of it. But um, where, the, where the body is regarded as filthy, mm -hmm. I don't think you really see that. Like it might be changed and confining, but I don't think there's much sense that the body is de filthy. I don't know. But perhaps I'm perhaps I'm just selectively remembering. The, mm. It might be constraining and limiting. Yeah, but, yeah. I don't mm. think there's anything to do with that. But it's like there is that kind of there is a sense of possibly like decay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are lots of tropes of disease. Um, which is, again, interesting in terms of systems, I guess, like, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about that cardiovascular right. um, yeah. aspect. But I think not filthy. I'm, I'm, mm. Yeah, I'm not remembering anything. Mm. Yeah, I don't think it's degrading in that sense. I think there's like, it's more, I don't know, but I mean, to me, it feels like it's more about how people people the the beings <laughs> react mm -hmm. to it and that's what that that is what defines the body mm -hmm. and whether it is like yeah glorified or not yeah. and it's more about those reactions and those reactions shift and change and yeah it is so it is a question of perception then yeah, I, yeah. the body and it can be perceived mm -hmm. as spiritual or perceived as yeah. vegetable because yeah. i mean like if we go back to the whole he became what he beheld yeah. that is about perception mm -hmm. um so I think it is that. I mean, yeah, partly. Yeah, <laughs> not the I, I would agree. I do think, like, despite the sort of depictions of the body as very restrictive and sort of uh, traumatic to the eternal self of the you know spirit, you could say, um, there is, you know, the, the body is the only vehicle for experience, and I think Blake's very much aware of that. And the way that he talks about the moment as being the pulsation of the artery, like his, mm -hmm. you know, our whole experience is through the body and filtered through the body. Yeah. And that comes out a lot, I think, in especially in the later poetry. I mean, the other thing which is important to Blake, when it's a word that echoes, I can't remember now from the, um, you know, the, the, the word list, if it's more about energy. And there's this whole thing about the body in motion and mm -hmm. perhaps almost a Tim Ingold idea, which I've gone on to you about in the past, and they're both of you, but you know, the, for Tim Ingold, it's the body that moves through space that generates meaning and identity. And it's interesting that, you know, Glad Day, that body is, mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy to read it as still, as sort of a crucifixion, mm -hmm. but it actually it seems to be moving through space. Yeah. Whereas, you know, this body's not confined, but it's also still, and it's not, you know, it's, mm -hmm. and one of your reasons, what, what he seems to want to do is that, that in response to the constant fluctuation of the eternal, he wants to kind of save identity. For understanding, you know, he wants to save people from harm by freeze framing things as they are and kind of saying, this is you, this is who you are and it's determined by divine law. Whereas Blake seems to be open to the, reconf you know, the identity is doing movement through space, which has risk. You know, it's risky and you, yeah. it's threatening and, you know, it, and sometimes you need to go to Beulah to, to, 
very reactive. <laughs> but I think the, mo the movement to the body is quite important principle yeah. in, in play. Yeah, I agree. And like we said about Albion Rose, you can even just see the way that the, the feet are stepping forward. Mm -hmm. You get that sense of motion mm -hmm. uh, in the visual image. And Larissa Kelly has written quite interestingly in a way about the way that when she thought about the fusely cut, I was trying to, the, you arrange the painting so they might look like mm -hmm. figures moving through space. If you read, similarly in the illuminated books, I'm not saying they're a, a flicked book, is that what they're called? Yeah. But in a way that you could, you know, there is a sense in which, mm -hmm. or it'd be interesting to think about them as frames of a film and whether figures do move between the pages. Yeah. You know? um. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'd like to kind of zoom out a little bit and take stock of the fact that the body was used as a metaphor quite widely in the 18th century, certainly not just by Blake by any means. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's very flexible metaphor um, with it being a master system composed of other minor systems. So it can kind of encompass any, any sort of bounded system with a diverse internal makeup. Um, so it's very often used as a metaphor to represent the nation. Um, so, for example, we see this in theories of trade and circulation, uh, such as Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. I think that was 1770s, was it? Probably? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also the popular idea of the body politic. Um, and the body politic is something that we've touched on a little bit before and that Blake uh, draws on a lot in his prophetic works. Um, and I'll ask Sharon now, if you don't mind, just to, <laughs> just to kind of give us an idea of how uh, Blake uh, kind of envisions the body politics. Your PhD thesis does give us a really kind yes. of fresh take on that. Yeah. So, yeah, my thesis was on the body politic, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> among other things. Yeah, among other things. A very um, rich piece of work. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's, it is this idea that society is envisioned as a a body and traditionally it's like you know head of state the head um and there are some really interesting ideas in the late like 18th century you can see there are quite a few historical prints actually where it visualizes mm -hmm. ideas of body politics mm -hmm. um and they're quite fun um if you can find them mm -hmm. um but in terms of blake i mean he's got this figure of albion mm -hmm. that kind of comes out in the later we mm -hmm. books and he is like representative of the nation and in the later Illuminated books it's really interesting because you have all these little beings that kind of interact and there's a lot of friction and tension mm -hmm. within Albion and it's not moving towards any sort of resolution mm -hmm. which kind of then brings interesting questions about what happens to the body politic mm -hmm. is it trying to be cohesive and function mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in a normative way or is it again trying to kind of open up, pull apart, reconfigure itself and work in ways that aren't kind of seen in that traditional format. Mm -hmm. So for me, I kind of take it from a disability angle mm -hmm. and think about it in terms of like an able body politic, which mm -hmm. is normative. It relies on this idea of wholeness and perfection mm -hmm. as function. Yeah. Um, but in Blake, it doesn't seem to be like that. There is still mm -hmm some sort of function and it doesn't rely on everyone kind of being happy and coming together and like working together cohesively um it's always in motion it goes back to what you're saying about like energy and that kind of thing right it's always in flux it's always moving mm -hmm. in some sort of direction and yeah. even if it seems to be falling apart i'm not sure if it's like that's the point of it but it seems to work still mm -hmm. in some sort of way yeah yeah yeah, so in your thesis, you can characterise that as Blake's rejection of the able body politic, yes, right? Because it's not working towards this idea of wholeness. Mm -hmm. And even in Jerusalem, like even when you kind of reach almost kind of the end, mm -hmm. it's not seeking this transcendent perfection, yeah. um, reunion with God, if you kind of go in yeah. that kind of direction. It's mm -hmm. still moving and it's not stopping and... Mm -hmm if it's still moving and not stopping, then it's not actually going to be complete. <laughs> or yeah, whole. there's no end point yeah. to be reached. Yeah, things are going out and coming back and yeah. the senses are still involved as well, it hasn't transcended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's interesting, I, I've, I've just um, read Mark Kendall's book about romantic pro progressivism and he, he doesn't have a chapter on Blake, but he has an interesting discussion of Blake. And one of the things he says is he's trying to save the idea of progress from an idea of a kind of unified public good that's homogenizing to an idea of progress which is suggesting is the one that we're trying to work with in contemporary form whereby 
you can have a sense of community which doesn't eradicate difference. And in a way, that's what, you know, yeah, Blake seems yeah. to be. There's clearly a narrative of a loss, a dismemberment, mm -hmm. and a coming back together. But the question is whether what, you know, whether that's coming back together in a kind of homogenous body, yeah. uh, the normative, as you said. Yeah, and, and it might well. not come back together in the way that you expect it to. Yeah. yeah. And Blake is all about the unexpected. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so you have almost like those different components, mm -hmm. and they all work together, they come apart, they reform in a different format, mm -hmm. and they still kind of work together. It, yeah. It's interesting to use that because the Canal book talks about hope that isn't necessarily bound up with expectation, mm -hmm. that it might be open to kind of mm -hmm. the unexpected, unexpected political form. So that is, um, that is, I think, a really interesting point in relation to that book. Yeah. yeah. I liked how you both picked up on that kind of idea of difference then, and particularly Blake's um, kind of um, attitude towards bodily difference and towards the other. Um, yeah. And that brings us quite nicely into uh, some depictions of the body in Jerusalem. I just need to find my plate. Oh, here they are. So uh, in Jerusalem, we encounter a lot of non-normative bodies. So for example, on plate 11, there is the uh, sort of uh, female torso with a swan's head and uh, swan's wings. Uh, on the frontispiece, uh, the title page, sorry, uh, there's also these sort of humanised butterflies. Um, on plate 78, there is a man with a chicken's head. And on... Perhaps it's an eagle when you think it's a chicken. Is that not a chicken? I thought that... that... <laughs> I think it <laughs> looks quite a giant. It's one of those things in place. Is it trying... Is it... An eagle would make work, but if a chicken said for fair enough. I did once live in a part of Los Angeles where they had a huge... Mm -hmm. Terrible. If now you called it to mind, so a boy in shorts and its head, it had been a, a fried chicken shop. It had a chicken's head. <laughs> they used to call it chicken boys. And now you store that image. Yeah. Well, but I think the point you're making. Let's right? a bird. Yeah. With a, bird's yeah. a man with a bird's head. And also on plate 80, there are these kind of um, human figures which are emerging from and into uh, worm like forms. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of brings us back to what we were saying before about being able to dissemble and reassemble the body with yeah. these different parts mm -hmm. it reminds me of like i don't know if you used to play this game when you were younger you'd have a piece of paper and one person would draw a head then you'd fold it over oh, and right. pass it on to the next yeah. person they draw the torso yeah. like it's really just the way that he's blake's constructing the body in these later works it's just so different from that kind of idealized human form that we saw in joseph of, of arimathea mm. um and um for glad day for example well, I guess the other point to make, which I mean, I think is a pleasure what you're saying, is that these are, in one sense, monstrous, or they're not, but they're not monsters. I mean, they're not being, they don't seem to be deployed. You know, some of them may be, when you read those parts of the text, negative, but it's very hard to read the butterfly figures as monstrous, yeah. but they are, they are kind of non normative mm -hmm. hybrids, or, you mm -hmm. know, so, and a lot of them, it's hard, it's hard to know. You know, the contemplative, Chicken eagle man is is <laughs> is not a is not a straightforwardly monstrous mm. uh, figure. I don't think the I mean, swan is a classical like think of think of yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that a uh, Newtonian pose yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Blake's depiction of Newton yeah mm -hmm. so there's kind of a sense of hybridity here a mixing of the human and the non-human which links into, like we're saying, this kind of openness to the other and to bodily difference. Um, so I just wanted to think a little bit about why this openness is so important to Blake and maybe why it becomes more important to him later on in his career and in his life. If you have any ideas on that. Well, I think I, I, I was starting to think I had an answer until you put the later in life thing. Is... <laughs> we'll do it. It... I mean, it may be I, I, arguably. I mean, this the the, the camera book is making me think of it. I mean, arguably, earlier on, there's a possibility that he believes in a sort of unrolling of enlightenment freedom, mm -hmm. and you know, stuff happens that make it clear that that it's not going to work. It's not going to be linear in that kind of way, um, but that it's still open to kind of unusual possibilities, and it hasn't closed off that. And so, similarly, his body, you know, it, it isn't an idea of change in progress that is like the the sort of the unrolling of an organic form into its final form mm -hmm. but that uh um you know other kind of combinations as possible mm -hmm. uh, how that fits into the whole black thing of you know uh, things the particularity of things is an interesting 
question. But then perhaps it's that these forms are these particular things. Some are beautiful, some are horrible, mm -hmm. but they're not. They are what they are. They're not yeah. necessarily monstrous. In yeah. That, yeah. yeah. And I think it's maybe kind of thinking about like maybe there is this question, this idea of the ideal, like mm -hmm. this kind yeah. of yeah. perfection, this wholeness, this yeah. what we assume is, yeah, like normative. Like, yeah, it's, it's like eventual. it's like pushing you to imagine and reconsider mm -hmm. what you think of as a normative body. Yeah. And I mean, with the swan-headed girl, like no one really understands or knows because she doesn't appear in the poem mm -hmm. at all. She's just there on the plate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think. Um, I think I wrote about her and I mentioned like we just we should just kind of take her as she is and yeah. accept that that is her form mm -hmm. and just kind of yeah. let her exist on the page mm -hmm. because in a particular yeah, yeah, that yeah. Uh, I think I like what you said about acceptance there just this idea of radical acceptance like it says in um, Marriage of Heaven and Hell everything that lives is holy mm -hmm. so the same goes for these um, sort of you know non-normative bodies as well I think so I think that hybridity that we were talking about within the sort of human and non-human bodies as it comes through in Jerusalem also allows us to think about the physical form of Blake's books and their own hybridity of text and image. Um, so to what extent can we say that Blake regarded his own body of work as a body or as a corpus? So let's shall we start with the production process then in, in a very general way. Yeah. And obviously it's a compared to... Most writers, although writers do move pen across a page and they leave in, but it's a bit, as the engraver his own works, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a process which his body and Catherine's body were, mm -hmm. you know, labor is a labor intensive process to produce these books. And obviously there are places where he seems to make reference to that as well. Um, and I think it's interesting in terms of some of the things you said that somebody like Tim Ingold, you mentioned, is interested in the way that meaning is produced by, uh, not just moving through space, but he's interested in things like drawing or working with wood and about the way that the experience of being experiences the pushback of materiality, that the wood may not do what you want it to, yeah. presumably moving the, the, the engraver through the copper, you don't just rationally impose mm. your pattern on it, you feel the copper pushing back and you have to adopt that. Obviously, Blake was very skilled in making you do kind of what he wanted mm -hmm. to, but in that process, he has to feel the materiality of yeah. what he's working with and feel yeah. his pushback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, definitely. I think I think it's very early in Jerusalem, maybe plate five, he writes something, a guide thou my hand as it trembles upon the rock of ages. So got that sense of the trembling hand, you know, the resistance from the material world in that process of creation. Um, and I think, th although you've got that resistance from the copper plate, it's still a very flexible medium yeah, yeah. in which to produce because... Blake could, um, and Joseph Fiscomi goes into this a lot in Blake and the idea of the book, the way that he could, even once he'd engraved the plates and printed it, still then be able to go back and edit and maybe recolor, take pen and ink and, and change things slightly. So just like with the, the body and this openness and flexibility of the body, I think is reflected also in his, yeah. in his medium. And Ingold's actually written about Blake, hasn't he, in a couple of places? He uses the, a quote from Milton, the Vortex quote, as an epigraph to his article on the world. I'm not too sure if he's written further right. than that. But, I'll, I will but, it, but for the, but because he's kind of queuing into these, what we've just been talking about, really, I guess. So. Oh, the world article is slightly different. I think because the one where it, the article, uh, the Ingold work about the saw, I think that's in his work about yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah. In the world one, it's about the vortex. Right. It's about this, um, the, I suppose, energy again, like we were saying, uh, how we we see forms as fixed, but really they're fluid and they're always right. energetic. And, yeah, which fits in what we're saying. What, exactly what we're body, saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the energetic yeah. body. It's not just the human body. I think the whole material world is is perceived as, as fluid yeah. and energetic mm -hmm. to some extent. Um, so the book is a body, is, yeah, yeah, corpus of the book, yeah. Well, one, one part of the answer you already hinted at, which was the, the fact you can, you know, if you think of the book like the body mm -hmm. and you think of the body as normative, mm -hmm. then you can't change the play. <laughs> I mean, you know, what I mean, if, if, yeah. if the corpus that is in the book you're mm -hmm. using is rearrangeable, yeah, into other forms, then it already suggests a sort of flexibility, yeah. like there's yeah. always going to be an inherent openness, yeah, yeah. 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 
Yeah, definitely. And Blake does refer to his work as giant forms. I think it's in a letter to Thomas Butts. Yeah. So you can see quite clearly he's got, he's also got this idea of, of his work as, as a body too, mm. as a giant body. Mm -hmm. um, so just to kind of, finish off and we've touched on this a little bit already now uh with blake's um the physicality of his production process um and this kind of brings us full circle back to the start of him learning uh, his uh, practice as an engraver um so i just wanted us to think a little bit about the role of blake's own body in his mm. work and how he how that comes through so it comes through in loss i think and his reference to metalwork tools uh, the hammer, the anvil, and also just as John was saying at the start, the way that musculature is so important to Blake's work. Maybe, maybe that's because his work was such a bodily kind of labour. Maybe he experienced muscle aches hunching over these copper yeah, plates. I've never seen it because you think somebody like Michael Phillips might have written on. Mm -hmm. Presumably, your certain muscles develop over others if mm. you're coppering. Yeah, in, I've not seen anybody ever write about that. But mm. I mean, there used to be that thing that you, know, you saw visions because he's been sniffing the acid of the <laughs> of the process but it's interesting to think about the process that literally i mean in terms of the the process rebounds on his own physicality yeah. and reshapes it would be an yeah. interesting thing to think about yeah yeah i'd be mad to cut that out so i can save it for my face yeah. <laughs> but you obviously presumably you have to plant your feet quite you have to mm -hmm. i mean i don't you know i imagine you have planted feet but you have to be flexible from mm -hmm. the waist mm -hmm. to, and you're leaning back and over and back yeah. over a plate when yeah. you're doing it. I'm not sure. I, 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 perhaps someone like Jesse for scanning your microphone has yeah. talked about that, but I'm not Maybe like how long quick movements just. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's like with most uh, poets or painters, it would really be mainly the hand and the arm that are involved. Yeah. But I think with engraving, it's really like the whole the whole body yeah. has to get yeah. behind that movement, yeah. especially like we're saying with the resistance from the copper plate. Yeah. Blake must have been so acutely aware of his own body mm -hmm. and its own limitations yeah. while he was making his work. Mm -hmm. And the colour, I mean, there are people in there, with the colour printing process, there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's some of the blotting and blowing, you don't quite know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that you just simply, this is going to be red with a firm yellow outline. You know, there's going to be a, a degree of, uh, mm -hmm. well, blotting and blowing is a negative for him, but, you know, there's going to be a degree of you're not finally absolutely sure that you're, there's not an image in the mind of what's going to happen that you know is going to be reproduced when you yeah. print it out. It doesn't doesn't work like that. And that's just, you know, in a sense, not an idea for Blake. It's just something that he knows as a habitus from doing what he does. You know, that the, the, the practice is not the execution of an idea in the mind onto yeah. paper. And there the, is always that unpredictability mm -hmm. again. Yeah, you could just process. wake up one morning and you've got chicken head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or an eagle's head. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think on that note, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. So thanks again so much, John, Thank and you. Sharon, for joining me and providing such a lively discussion. And thanks to anyone who listened.